Hi, my name is Robin Cohen. I am the lead designer and chief storyteller of Storytonic, a game company that focuses on narrative experiences to transform the mind and touch the heart. And today I'm going to be talking a little bit about intergenerational game design. So topics that we're going to cover today include what intergenerational game design is, who the audiences are for this particular type of product, considerations that we should be keeping in mind, which will delve a bit into some developmental psychology so that we can understand audiences of different generations a little bit more deeply. We're also going to look at how to design for both competition and collaboration, and I'll end with some recommendations. We have 30 minutes, so it's going to be a wild ride, but I'll be available to answer questions the day of the event. So I hope to talk to some of you then about any questions that you might have. So what is intergenerational game design? Um, just real quickly, I'll, I'll say at a high level, it's really about creating content that is accessible and engaging to audiences of different generations. When you look at it a little more closely, you can kind of divide this into two big sections. When you look at the research, intergenerational game design often focuses on bringing older adults, typically people over the age of 55, but in addition, usually past the age of retirement, to actually be a part of the process of the design and early pre-production of a game to help developers who in our industry are still typically between the ages of 28 and 35 to understand the motivations, the expectations, and the changes that happen with aging from the point of view of folks who have actually gone through some of those changes. The way we're going to look at this today, and, and I think the, the other side of intergenerational game design, is how we as designers can create content that is appropriate for people that are a part of multiple generations to play together. Specifically, I'm hoping that we as designers will make more of an effort to create games that are appropriate for parents to play with their kids, but also for grandparents to play with their grandkids or their own children. And so there are, again, just some considerations I think it's helpful to keep in mind to make content that's actually going to be engaging and enjoyable for each of the different generations that might be involved in play. So then you might ask yourself why, right? You might be perfectly comfortable creating games that are for one audience of people and not necessarily be too worried about bringing audiences of different generations together. I'll look at some different types of reasons. I think some of them are a little bit more on the data-driven side and some of them are a little bit more on the emotional side um, and hopefully all of that will interest you or at least one or the other. So. On, I'll start, I guess, really with the selfish side. Um, generation X is the generation that grew up with video games, right? They experienced arcade era, early consoles, all the way through the current generation of consoles, gaming on the PC, as well as now gaming on mobile devices. And so about five years ago, as a younger member of Generation X, I realized that the oldest members of my generation were turning 50. And now this year, the oldest members of my generation are turning 55. So they are technically older adults. And I realized that the game industry, again, made up typically of folks in the range of 20 to 35. Um, a lot of data shows that less than 5% of the creators, the designers in our industry are over the age of 50 that those folks aren't necessarily prepared to design content for older adults. Another big factor, and, and again, on the data side, for those of you who are motivated by that, is money. The AARP has done some great research. They released two big reports on gaming preferences in 2016 and 2019. In 2016, they found a significant number of older adults playing games, and they were spending about $500 million a year on game products. Just three years later in 2019, running that survey again, they found larger numbers of folks playing games, not surprising since Generation X was beginning to age into their demographic range, which starts at 50. And the amount of money spent jumped to $3.5 billion, which is an astonishing increase and obviously shows that there is plenty of money to be made targeting older adults. And in this case, with intergenerational game design, creating games that older adults can play with their younger friends, with their children or their grandchildren. Another big thing for me is I think accessibility is important. It's an area of passion for me as a game designer. And so anything that we can do 
as developers to create content that allows people with you know, a variety of aptitudes to be successful playing a game is valuable. We all deserve to have the pleasure of play and we can make design choices that make that more likely. Another thing I think is really important to keep in mind is sort of the issues that are presenting themselves to people over the age of 55. And when you think about sort of typical complaints this audience might have, you might think about things like aches and pains or having you know, access to disposable income. But one of the most commonly reported issues is loneliness. It's actually considered an epidemic among older adults. And so by creating games that are appropriate for intergenerational play, we can help to ease that. I think you know, regardless of whether isolation and loneliness is something you've really thought about before 2020, all of us to a certain extent have experienced it this year. And so when you think about how impactful experiences have been that have brought people together, like Animal Crossing, for an example, I think it hopefully lends some weight to the idea that a pervasive and epidemic loneliness among the elderly, um, among older adults, I should say, should be addressed. And so we can be a part of doing that. So let's talk about these audiences. I just want to get you thinking about the age ranges that we'll be talking about today so you can keep that in context as we move forward. So we have really five main audiences we're going to discuss, though we could certainly technically add a sixth with um, what's called the silent generation, which are people over the age of 75. But based upon the data that we have available from the ESA Essentials, from the AARP, we're going to focus on these five. And so Right now, people who are considered baby boomers, who are the likely parents of members of Generation X, as well as older millennials, are between the ages of 56 to 74. Generation X, which I've mentioned I'm a part of, um, parents of younger millennials and members of Generation Z, um, maybe even old parents of Generation Alpha, are between the ages of 40 to 55. Millennials, who, again, um, are, are not kids anymore, um, are likely to be uh, parents of members of Generation Alpha, are now between the ages of 24 and 39. Generation Z falls between the ages of 8 to 23, and then Generation Alpha from 1 to 7. I will say this about Generation Alpha. There are developmental changes that happen with aging that we're gonna to touch on in just a moment that can make parts of this audience more challenging to design for. And if you've ever been around kids under the age of three, that's probably not surprising, but keep these age ranges in mind as we move on. So when we talk about considerations, what we're really gonna look at is a little bit of developmental psych. We're gonna look at how people change physiologically, cognitively, um, in motor control, in areas of sensation and perception that we should keep in mind as we're trying to create content, either for a particular audience within these generations, or again, in content where we're trying to bring members of these generations together. So big things to keep in mind. On the cognitive side, as I mentioned, when we look at members of Generation Alpha, there's a critical age range, which happens right between five and a half and six, where kids begin to more firmly develop a true sense of cause and effect. And so I think for us who are looking at creating intergenerational games where, again, parents and kids or grandparents and kids are playing together, it's probably going to be a little easier to design what we consider as more traditional play experiences, which have at their root, obviously, players' ability to learn how to be successful in the virtual worlds we create if they have that sense of cause and effect. And so that six to seven age range is going to be a fruitful place for us. And if you think, you know, for the ESRB rating E for everyone, right, we might talk about seven and up anyway. Um, but looking at those kids, their ability to problem solve becomes more highly developed. You also see a stronger sense of social context so that they're not just kind of thinking about themselves in relationships to the things that are going on around them in the world, but taking more, I guess, care to notice the emotional states and reactions of other people and to understand their context in relationship to those people. And so when you look at bringing people together to play, uh, whether it's locally or it's through some networked play, 
I think that's an important cognitive advancement to keep in mind. So other things that we might look at, um, something like vision. For folks who are physiologically typical, uh, vision, you know, again, from early childhood onward, um, you know, barring things like colorblindness or illness or injury should allow them for uh, a pretty large central and peripheral field of view that will allow them to make good use of the visuals that we're creating games, including things like elements of a heads up display. One of the things that happens though, as we age is that that field of view begins to change. And so by the time we are you know, getting into that age range, that's technically older adult, again, 55 and up. So we might be looking at our older Gen Xers and our baby boomers. We begin to see shrinkage both in central vision as well as in peripheral vision. And so when you think about that related to play, User interface design obviously is something that we might need to address to make sure that older players aren't missing vital information that they need in order to be able to be successful. Looking at things like font size and contrast are also really helpful for folks that have some kind of visual decline, again, whether that's related to age or some other condition. Another thing that's really interesting are the physiological changes that happen in our degree of reflex response, accuracy, and strength and flexibility in relationship to motor control. And so you think about you know, holding a controller and having a complicated kind of choreography of button prompts, of joystick movement, of bumpers and triggers that are required to be successful in a play experience. Think about a mobile device that might require us to either manipulate virtual joysticks and buttons or to tap and swipe in particular contexts in a way that requires speed and accuracy. As we age, there's declines that we see that actually begin as early as our late 20s to early 30s in motor control, flexibility, speed, and stamina. And so basically what happens as we age is that those deficiencies become more pronounced. And so, you know, by the time somebody is maybe in that baby boomer range, particularly in your mid sixties to early seventies, it's quite noticeable that your reflex response isn't gonna be as fast typically as someone who's younger, that you're not gonna have the same kind of accuracy. And imagine the challenge of hitting the right button or controlling a mouse or tapping the right element on a screen when suddenly you're physiologically less likely to have the levels of accuracy that you may have had 10 or 15 years before. I would say it's worth keeping in mind too that there is some overlap in what three to six year olds experience in terms of manual dexterity and motor control that parallels what we see in much older adults. And so in designing experiences for younger grandchildren and grandparents, you may find some areas of overlap in terms of the degree of reflex intensiveness you decide to design for, as well as how forgiving you decide to make reflex-based play, um, if you have anything that's reflex-based or time-driven at all. In addition to the physiological changes, it's worth taking note of the fact that processing speed also shifts for older adults. And so the impact there is interesting because it affects the psychomotor response. So that sort of thought to reflex response, but also affects basically how quickly we can recognize patterns and adapt to novel situations. And so if we know, for an example, that in creating an intergenerational experience, we're asking an older adult to flex to a new platform or to you know, flex to a new genre, we may need to find ways to gentle that learning curve a bit to give them the time that it will take to be introduced to, to practice and, and sort of adapt to the needs of that particular game so that they can have an enjoyable experience. I would also say, think about changes that occur in hearing. For older adults, even, again, without any kind of illness, disease, or injury, um, for older adults, typically high frequency hearing begins to decline. And so in addition to that high frequency hearing, the de degree of ability to distinguish between sounds easily also begins to diminish. And so think about 
how cluttered your soundscape might be if there's dialogue and sound effects happening, or if you have, again, in a, in a living space, people talking to each other, or in network play, people talking to each other, and you have um, music that's playing or sound effects that are happening, it could be very difficult for the older adult player to distinguish between all of that. And so having options where players can toggle off music or sound effects um, or having options where players can see closed captioning um, to, to be able to see dialogue that's happening or um, sliders that allow them to control the volume of dialogue, music and sound effects can be a very helpful thing. All of these considerations obviously are looking at things from an accessibility standpoint, right? Again, understanding how we change as we age and the typical windows of time within which those changes start to happen and how those might affect play. And again, you know, some of it is when you stop to think about it, really interestingly challenging to accommodate, right? So when I decide, for an example, that I want to bring parents or grandparents and younger children together, say, you know, seven to 10 year olds, well, what platform are we using? Because seven to 10 year olds have smaller hands than an adult. And so there may be some configurations of control scheme if we're playing on a keyboard or we're playing on a, a console with a traditional controller that literally they may not be able to flex to you know, do certain inputs at the same time. And so similarly, when we're looking at older adults who lose some flexibility and maybe dealing with issues of tendon strain or arthritis, are we creating configurations of control scheme that are actually pleasant and playable but in addition to those considerations, think about motivation. Different players come to games for different reasons. And so understanding what is driving someone to play is a really interesting thing. You know, when we look at younger adults, teens and older children, often there are discussions of things like challenge and flow. And so, you know, what is considered an appropriate appealing level of challenge when you consider that from a flow perspective is this, you know, kind of perpetual escalation of difficulty as we per improve our performance. And that's considered engaging and desirable. When you're, however, a younger child or an older adult and perhaps are dealing with issues of endurance, strength, and flexibility, certain things might become uncomfortable or even painful over time physically, um, and certainly might become frustrating if they're designed at such a rapid fire pace that you're just not able to keep up. And so challenge might mean something different. And when you look at older adults, it's not to say they aren't looking for challenge, but they're looking for challenge that's appropriate to their physiological and mental condition. Um, they're also looking to connect. They're also looking to have, you know, engaging, inspiring roles. And so we'll delve into that a little bit more as we transition into our discussion on designing for competition and designing for collaboration. And so when we look at this idea of designing for competition, I'm really talking about, you know, zero sum experiences where you're gonna bring people together and one person is going to win and everybody else is going to lose. Um, I do think there's a bridge between the two when we think about multiplayer experiences where you might be able to form a team, for an example, and that team might work together cooperatively to defeat another team. Um, and obviously then have that blend of cooperative and competitive play. But let's look at them distinctly in the time window that we have. And so when we're designing for competition, some important things to keep in mind, as I mentioned already, platform, you can reduce barrier to entry, reduce the cognitive strain of those novel situations by choosing a platform that older adults tend to play on already, which currently falls into that range of mobile and PC based platforms for older adults. But as Gen Xers roll into that age range, you have a generation of people who have grown up with consoles as well. And so in the, in the next, say, three to 10 years, you're going to have a lot of older adults who are perfectly comfortable playing with console-based devices as well. In terms of local versus networked play, 
I think this goes back to the issue of loneliness. You know, if we're looking to create a sense of connection, if we're looking to, you know, alleviate that sense of isolation, obviously bringing people together is great. Now, in certain circumstances, like the ones we're living through this year, that isn't always possible. And so if you are going to engage in networks play, my recommendation would be to have that based on on peer to peer or player selection based situations versus just randomly matchmaking different generations of players together into situations with strangers. Why? Well, one, I think, you know, part of what's driving the older adult to want to play with others is connection, is taking on a role that is beneficial and contributory. And so being able to support and play with people they know is important, even if they're playing competitively. Um, they're looking for a role that's meaningful and positive connection to other players. Another big issue is communication. Older adults and younger children are not as able to or willing to tolerate the sort of breakdowns in behavior and communication that often happen in competitive play. And so allowing them to play with people they select, who they know, will hopefully help to alleviate some of those problems that happen with a more sort of blind matchmaking experience. I've mentioned already, something that's really important obviously to keep in mind is that different types of challenge are going to be appropriate for different audiences of people and so you definitely want to make sure that in creating competitive experiences your mechanics are flexible enough to let people play to their strengths ways that players who are more reflexively adept can be successful as well as ways that players who are going to be more strategically adept can be successful because if i as a player for example who have great twitch reflexes and, and maybe some good pattern recognition, I'm continually losing to someone who thinks more strategically than me, I might become frustrated, just as the player who has incredible strategic ability to bring to bear, but maybe doesn't just by, you know, dearth of age have those twitchy re reflexes to bring to bear, and I'm losing all the time because of it, I'm probably going to feel quite disgruntled. And so there's a very interesting challenge here to create play experiences that allow for folks to pull on these different aptitudes and find paths to victory versus a dominant strategy lying with either reflex driven or strategy driven play. So that brings us to designing for collaboration. And so again, the idea here is that we have players playing cooperatively. Now they're working together to accomplish the same goals. And so, you know, obviously they're vying against the, the systems of the game in this case, but allows them to do that with a sense of camaraderie and connection. And so there are some things we still need to keep in mind, right? We're certainly still gonna be considering the platform of release for a variety of reasons related to familiarity and feasibility of certain control schemes. We're also still gonna be looking at pros and cons in and around local versus networked play. Although I do think with cooperative experiences in networked play, we're a little less likely to fall into some of the same traps when it comes to negativity in behavior or communication. That being said, I do think it's worth recognizing the potential issue that is commander syndrome in cooperative experiences where one person will sort of boss everyone else around and kind of direct all their actions versus letting players have their own individual sense of agency. So I do think it's important especially when we have adults playing with children to create those opportunities for agency and authority for the younger player, as well as for the, the parent or grandparent that they might be playing with. I've mentioned before, you know, part of the big motivation for older adults and engaging in multiplayer play is to basically feel as if they're contributing to the success of the people that they're playing with. And so allowing for those moments of guidance or mentorship, again, without it falling over into the pattern of commander syndrome, uh, is gonna be something that's quite appealing to the older adult player, particularly. I think what it really comes down to is that older adults are looking for a way to feel needed, right? They want to connect and they want the connection to be meaningful. They want affection and friendships, not just surface level interaction. And so by creating opportunities 
for grandparents to play with their children or to play with their grandchildren. It's a great way to build that sense of camaraderie, of connection and community of usefulness that hopefully for them will reduce loneliness, but hopefully for younger generations as they see you know, the value and the, the strategic problem solving and the wisdom of older generations to maybe even have uh, an impact on reduction on ageism, which would be a wonderful thing. So that brings us to some recommendations that I'd like to make for those who would like to continue on on this particular avenue in game design. So my first thing is look at research. There is a ton of research out there that is readily available for you to take advantage of. Um, I've mentioned already the ESA Essential series. They release really great data every year. If you look at the report from 2019, you'll be able to get this by generation breakdown of where players are playing, the percentage of players amongst men and women, and the kind of games they're playing that can be a great way to start understanding different audience demographics and what might bring them together. You also have access, uh, thanks to the AARP, to the gamer motivation surveys that were done in 2016 and in 2019 by Nelson Kakula that are a wonderful wealth of information about player motivations, habits around platform and play habits between generations of players. I would also recommend you know taking the advice of the research from Luce and Marston and DeShooter among others about bringing older players into your design process working with them to see what it is they're actually looking for from games from a gameplay experience from an emotional experience from an aesthetic experience from a narrative experience and, and allow that to help to inform some of the decisions that you're making. Now for intergenerational game design specifically, I would say don't stop at bringing in older adults, but bring in the generations you'd like to see them playing with. You know, bring in those older children, bring in those younger teens and see again, you know, where the overlap and where the differences are in what those audiences are looking for from a play experience. I think it's also, really important as you do get into development and you're getting to that point where you know you're running participants to see what their response is that you test your product with multiple audiences you you can't just you know sort of focus on one arbitrary demographic but you want to make sure that you're bringing in members of each of the audience groups that you're hoping to engage with your particular product. Because again, you need to see how they respond to play. If you can create play scenarios where they're actually playing together um, so that you can see the interaction that occurs, I think that can also be tremendously valuable in terms of the insights that it can offer. I would also strongly recommend that you experiment with accessibility features. Don't be afraid to you know, dig into the games that offer all these interesting, robust options for differences in vision, for differences in hearing, for differences in motor control and manual dexterity. Um, and, and so many of these you know, interesting products that have come onto the market in the past few years, particularly in addition to those accessibility features that are native to the game itself, you know, look at the different adaptive tools that have become available on the market that allow us to experiment with different control schemes that again can help to accommodate uh, different um, levels of, of physiological uh, ability or different styles of approach um, physiologically to play. And so, you know, pick, pick a game or games that utilize those tools and tech and actually experiment with playing via those control schemes to see what it's like and, and how it might encourage you to adapt certain aspects of your experience um, or even you know, encourage you to make your experience able to be played through some of this adaptive tech that exists. Because again, I think you know, broadening our audience is not only potentially going to be helpful to us on the profitability side, but also harkens back to, you know, that ability for every person to experience joy through play, I think is a really powerful thing. If, if I had to say, you know, take away one thing, I would say, just get out of your own head. Don't assume that every person who plays a game is looking for the same experience you are, or that they are, 
going to bring the same skills and ability to bear physiologically and cognitively. You know, talk to lots of different types of people from different dem demographic backgrounds, whether that's gender or age or ethnicity, um, whatever the case may be, to see what it is they're looking for and how they experience play, what they think are great about games in their current uh, kind of pattern and path and how they think games could be better suited to them. So wrapping things up, uh, I just want to say thank you. Thanks for coming out on a talk on intergenerational game design. I know that it's a, a subject that has been talked about in, in research, particularly for a little bit over a decade now, but it's a topic that I hope that we'll see more traction in conferences like this, where we'll see members of the industry talking about how they have or how they plan to design their product to suit the needs of different generations of players. You know, we're, we're well past the days if they ever existed, where most of our players are 12 to 18 year old kids. Our audience is varied and diverse and it's better for our industry. It's certainly better for our players if we recognize these interesting and, and very different audiences of people that we have that we can create content for um, and learn about them. And again, connect to them so that we can better tailor content to their needs, wants, and expectations. So if you'd like to talk about this further, I encourage you to visit my website at robincoman.com. You can also reach out to me at, at robincoman on Twitter or through LinkedIn. So I hope to hear from you um, during question and answer that's gonna be ongoing during the airing of this particular talk. But I also hope that you'll reach out to me after so that we can continue having a conversation about this very interesting path in game design that has a ton of potential to bring joy and fun and memorable experiences to audiences of all ages. So thank you again for attending. Have a wonderful rest of Siege.